the goal of it is really to talk about testability um, and testability of your, your systems. Um, I have a couple ideas in mind, how do you make use of this time most effectively? Um, our limited time together. Uh, one thing I had asked you to do prior to the class was to come up with some ideas of, uh, about testability challenges for your project. Uh, so thoughts on this? Testability. So first of all, what is testability? We could tell what, what's testability? You just watched the video on it. What is, what is it? Yeah, I'm busy and testable. Sorry? Uh, yeah, it's the ability to test, test your system. And so when we say we're investing in testability, we're talking about improving the ability of your system to be effectively tested. Give me some barriers to, to testability in systems, in modern systems. What are, what are some common problems uh, that make, that, that inhibit testability, that, that stymie testability, that uh, block testability? What are some hurdles? Yes. Uh, uh, well, hi, thank you. Uh, so some tests can't actually run, can't be automated, they have to be tested manually, which makes things good. Good. Yeah. So some tests may have to be tested manually. Give me, give me a, an example of a sort of test will be very hard to automate it. You're testing something that you really need to test manually. There's absolutely needs like this. Give me an example. UI would be the first thing that comes to mind. Yeah. And what about the UI? I mean, there's some things in the UI that you could test in an automated basis. You know, you. You enter three in this text box, four in the other, and you press the button, and it gives it gives you know one and three, and it gives four as the sum or something like that. Like that can be tested in an automated fashion. But what sort of thing can't be tested? I think you're you're really onto something with UI. Well, like say it's a uh, there's a few things. So let's say you know window resize is just to make sure everything's so visible or making sure the color is all right or the font size is big enough. Ah, yes, exactly. Usability, ease of use, stuff like that. You really need a human for that. Yeah, usability, ease of use, the um, the the sort of visual layout, whether it's it's kind of a comfortable layout to look at. Yes, Armin. Exactly, exactly. Yes, that's exactly it. Um, so animation can be something which in principle elements of it could be tested, but um it could be uh it could be something where you know how it looks, whether it looks acceptable as an animation can depend on on human perception, right? Um Virtual reality interfaces are classic in this. If, if, you, if you have a VR interface, like um, with the Oculus, the Oculus Quest, or, or you know, subsequent versions of that, um, the user experience there actually can be very good or it can be very adverse. We've done quite a lot of development for it. And if you're not careful about it, you can get into regimes where like the, the frame rate can actually be so slow makes you sick. It makes you feel sick. And there's not going to be uh, an effective automated test for that. So, so uh, that's good. Anything else? Manual testing? Yes, Ian. Um, it's going to be slightly off, but the testing the like. The connections between individual programmers, uh, code, no, it's not it's that. It, uh, so th you're talking about integration, and um, generally those things can be tested automatically. No, you don't want to just test automatically. I mean, amongst other things, you're going to want to do peer review, et cetera, um, to make sure that, you know, if this programmer assumes that a result code of one means bad and zero means good, that this other one doesn't assume the opposite. 
when it's fast to it, right? But generally you can automate it, you can have automated tests today. So what are, um, but these are good. So manual tests, yeah, well, Hodge is exactly right. There are certain things that are only amenable to an uh, to an uh, to a uh, manual test. Um, so that's a barrier. What other barriers are there to effective testability? Yes, the code is written. The way code is written. Yes. Um, can you can you give me um, so all the uh, functionality rather than a bunch of yeah. So so now you're getting the, the issues that um, are more technical in nature, but pretty common in today's software environment. So if you have um, a tangled hairball of code, or one thing calls another and calls another uh, inside of this, and you've got you know all sorts of of uh, interfaces in and out of this, etc. It can be really hard to test what's going on, even if you have only one entry point here, and then you have a god awful amount of stuff in there interacting, you know, within this system. It can be hard to test. Why do I say that? Why do I say it's hard to test? Um, test the system. Yeah. So, uh, so, uh, deep. That we said, like, it doesn't how the code is written. So, something is missing, like, if someone wrote stuff onto it, but they didn't return the like values. Right. So it can fail. If something is missing and someone is being lower into the but it's not actually things like that. Yeah. So, I mean, generally, what's going on in these internal pieces? It's it's hard to um it's hard to verify using just kind of your little hole that you're peeking in out here whether these different pieces are working together properly, right? Whether there's certain steps being missed, whether certain things are being returned from. Um no, it's not that they can't test this way. This is what black box testing of this would look like, right? You, you give in some inputs, you get out some outputs, that's what you got, right? But uh, it's hard. It's hard to have confidence that this is working properly. So that's something about the way code is written that, you know, it's lots of internal pieces. Or worse yet, this is just one function and this is you know, a huge, massive 500 line function of, of code, right? With the, without even sub functions. In it. With sub functions, you could break it apart and test each of them one hopes, at least with mocking. What other thing? What other thing? Yes. Uh, Mohammed. I think uh, for the um, lack of comments. Yes, lack of comments in here, lack of good. Look at lack of good code hygiene. Give me something else besides lack of comments. Uh, yeah, she. Yes, uh, that's right. So if they're all interacting and something goes wrong, there's an actual question of which. Uh, you know, which one is responsible, right? And sometimes it could be, it might not just be one, right? It might be the interfaces between one and the other, right? Again, maybe one reasonably says, for me, one is gonna mean failure and zero is gonna mean success. And the other one says, for me, one is gonna mean success and zero is gonna mean failure. Both are perfectly reasonable. Something inherently unreasonable about either of them. But they don't play out. And when they call each other, they don't work together, right? Uh, because each thinks the other is using a different convention. So sometimes it's not the fault of one or the other. It's the fault something about the way they interact, right? Um, so lack of comments, I heard other things. Yes. Um, to me, like something that I encounter myself when like during this spread while coding is the usage of so many new libraries that I personally haven't used before. Uh -huh. So like following, it's basically the lack of like comprehensive understanding of the actual lines of code 
Yeah. Uh, one thing, like one really tricky, and it immediately came to me when you were talking is I had a problem. I was trying to de decrypt the password. Yeah. And I had a problem when I was using Postman and request. And the issue was that I'm missing the await before the uh, the request because decrypting the password takes time. And I just, yeah. it's just one word. And I have to Google and spend a lot of time for it. So like it's stuff like that makes it really hard to like track down the, the source of the issue. Yeah, I think uh, that's right. There are particularly certain types of um, of things involving concurrency, for example, or asynchronous updates, et cetera, that can be really difficult to uh, to debug. So I think that's um, these are. These are really good comments about barriers to testability. Now, to illustrate some of these, I wanted to hand out some code that that you know could serve as the basis for some feedback from you. Um, uh, and in other versions of this class, I've done this later, and I've actually used the code from the projects. Which always gets a chuckle out of uh, the groups. Um, uh, and uh, in this semester, I'm not going to be doing that, but I have provided code on the course site here. Um, so if you go to um, the Canvas site for the course, you'll find there's an in class exercise. And you'll find there's Two components of this that I want to feature first. One is the Conway scheme of like ugly, <laughs> the Conway scheme of like better. So I actually have fiscal copies that I printed before this, but I don't have enough for everyone here. Um, I have on the order of five or six of them of each printed. Um, so my thought is those who have devices, and I think that's many people here. Um, you can use your devices. Those who don't have devices, I can hand these out and there's not gonna be enough, enough of them to pass around, but at least by looking together at it, you should be able to, to sort of uh, get a sense of what we're talking about. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand some of these out. Um, again, those who have laptops, could you use them? And, uh, or tablets or whatever, and maybe others can come around them. Um, and uh, uh, so I'll give one of each of these. Um, who else wants a physical one? That there, okay, great, terrific. Okay, so the the big one, the the left hand one, the uh, the the thin one is the the bad one. So, so wait, some people can get it. So, there's no have trouble. Maybe you could try again and, or try to switch to one of the other networks or something. Okay, so here's the, here's the question. This, this Hey, Daniel, I had uh, referred people, apparently the power on the laptop, um, uh, so it wasn't connected properly, so it, it died for a bit. I had referred people to two files on the Canvas site. One is called Conway's Game of Life Ugly. This is down in the in-class exercise area. Another is called Con uh, Conway's Game of Life Better Version 2, okay? And basically, the students are looking them over to identify 
some issues that inhibit testability in the first of those. Conway's game of life of those. Okay. It's down at the bottom of the uh, course site, um, the course canvas site. It, it says in class exercises. Do you see it? Okay. Yeah. It's the first two items in there. Yeah, on the home page. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to get going again here. So, so give me some comments on the, ba the bad and the ugly terms. Um, what was, uh, when, when I say it was ugly, when I say it was bad, give me some reasons that there are code smells that might inhibit testability here. Yeah, so G. I don't know what it's doing, but there are no comments. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> you're not sure what in the world is going on. So no comments are part of that, but there's other things that contribute to not knowing what's going on. Anyway. So yeah, um, maybe again? Alan. Uh, Alan? Alan, Alan. Alan, yeah. Um, everything is in one function. Everything is in one function. It's all one big hairball, right? Um, so that makes... Again, you're viewing this thing through a straw and you're not sure what's going on inside of it, which means if something were wrong inside, you might not notice it, right? <laughs> Except if it happened to return the wrong value, but maybe it returns the right value, even though it, it did something wrong along the way, or maybe you don't notice that it returned the wrong value in this case. So yes, all right, if you uh... Magic numbers instead of macros. Magic numbers galore. A hundred, ninety-nine, uh, fifty thousand, uh, and one hundred one. Surely those are like those aren't total coincidences that it's like ninety-nine, one hundred, one hundred one. But like, is this hundred the same as? Is this 101 because it's related to this 100 or that 100? Uh, you know, it, this is, I'll tell you, this is a number of rows, this is the number of columns, but it's different hundreds, right? And this 101, it's not clear which hundred it's for. Presumably it's 100 plus, this, uh, this 101 is 100 plus one, but which hundred it is, it's not clear. Yeah, so it, that's a really good point. Others, uh, yeah, so your name there, Mr. Riley. Yeah. Sashi. 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 Yeah. Uh, maybe your names are not clear. Very clear. <laughs> A, B, C, F, I. Uh, yeah, uh, capital A, capital B, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, they leave, they leave a lot to the imagination, right? Um, so Ian. The structure of the GIF statements is so complicated that even if you spend a good amount of time, it's going to be hard to get into each one of those. Yeah, I mean, I'm actually, I feel really lucky folks didn't like stampede out of the room when I gave this to you, you know, uh, or or like, you know, revolt um, and and overthrow me or something. Because, I mean, this is, this is quite horrible, right? Trying to visually trace through. What the indenting? I mean, look at it. Yeah, it's, it's horrible, Riley. Indentations. The indentations like will drive someone mad, right? It's it's horrible here. Um. Uh. By the way, this is nowhere worse than I've seen much much worse. Than this. You know, I see where it's all like like that. Um, particularly for people who are not from computer science background, who then try to write code, and it's like. 
Yes, I made it. Uh, on, on. Yeah, uh, so there's a lot of tools that get stolen in the yes. age of illustration. So you have, I guess, and it even yeah. think it's not the same thing as in Alistair, but they pretty odd numbers. Yeah, so it's it's pretty. So, so like, take a look at this and this, right? It's the same logical expression. Here it just happens to be applied to B. Here it happens to be applied to A, right? Um, and yeah, your name? James. James. There's no like error checking and for like assume that like it's all gonna work out just fine. Yeah, give me an example where it assumes it's gonna work just fine. Uh, when it opens a file, it doesn't know if it exists or not. Yeah. <laughs> it's being interrupted. Yeah. And you don't like as the programmer, you don't have total control over what's in like whether the file's there or not, whether the file's readable or not, whether the file's corrupted or not, you have to be ready to handle any eventuality with that, right? Um, but this is like the assumes, of course it's gonna work, right? Um, and and then this is like to kill you like this. Ah, um, yeah, driving. Yeah, so it's so you have this if this you know this the, the rest of it like that, but uh, you know if this were by the way something I've seen that I can't it's horrible if this is indented then it looks like it's inside this if but it's really not and or you have if and then a semicolon after it and something after it looks indented and it's like yes um yeah maybe yeah, I don't know if it makes sense or not, but does the program only have one function? So yeah, you find the uh, you initialize the variable at the top, and then the two. Yeah, that, I mean, so so those are there. I mean, th those are available, but you're right; those needn't be external to this function. Yeah, because they're all only used. Th their lifetime is limited. To the to this function, yes. So uh, yeah, the only fact the fact that it's written in C. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, funny you mentioned that. Yes. Uh, so some are reason there are reasons to to work at, at times in C. There are some embedded applications where C is the only effective language. There are some cases where you're dealing with robotic systems where it may be necessary, but yeah, you want to, as a computer scientist, you want to be able to pick your language um, for the problem, not have your language pick you. Um, you don't want to only be a C person or only be a Java person or whatever, or you're, you're really limiting your career. So, uh, yes, B. Don't your code. The debugger is going to have like a real trouble. Yeah, uh, you mean someone who's debugging it? Uh, yeah, yeah. I thought about, I think I wasn't sure if you meant the person or the tool. Yeah, the, the tool will process it, but it's the first that um, is going to have issues. Uh, yeah, so name? Uh, so, 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 I got it. Uh, it's it's funny to like intentionally write a 2D of the app and it's 1D. Yeah, so it's flattening it into 1D, what's what is naturally a 2D array is what you're going to think. And, and I think that's exactly right. Um yeah, so so this code is is highly objective. This, this is torture code. Um and it's it's uh, painful to even look at. And the fact that you folks are reacting so strong, strongly to this is a good sign. It's, you really want to develop a sense of quality and you want to develop a sense when there's danger in things. This code is dangerous. And it's dangerous in part because it can't be tested. So you list out a lot of smells, but I want to emphasize that these sort of smells get in the way of not just debuggability, which is mentioned, by G, but testability as well. Um, it makes it difficult at a practical level for a tester to look at this code 
and try to anticipate good test cases amongst other things. Now, the developer could write some test cases for this, but it's very hard to write test cases for this by you know calling main because it's it's limited what you have access to about what main has done, right? You could maybe out, you know read the output of it and feed in put feed in certain inputs for the initial state and up and get outputs from the output state, but that's about all. It's basically black box testing on some very complicated code. Um, this sort of code needs testing urgently, but it inhibits it. It makes it harder to test it. it makes it harder for other devs to understand it so that they can test it. Now, I provided you beyond this some an example of the same system divided up in a fashion which uses lots of functions with clear specifications and clear naming. And you can you can you know argue about the aesthetics of it, about how long names should be or or you know how long the function should be. But basically it has intention revealing names, things like update cell or update space or run scenario, right? Um, here's here's the, the whole of main here. And why does it look so short here? Why is it why is it appear so short compared to the other one? The other one main is ginormous. This one is comparatively short. Why is that? Yeah, we're calling other functions rather than putting exactly. You're run. calling run scenario here, uh, and that's performing the line share of that work. But there's also read state and write state, so the work gets compressed into a smaller bit for me because you're delegating it. And the fact that you are delegating it means that you're delegating to things which can each be tested, right? So run scenario. Can be tested. You can pass it different arguments, see what it returns as arguments, etc. Same thing with update uh, the space, same thing with update the cell, etc. And each of them, like update space, in turn iterates through oh, there's a row count and there's a column count. No, no magic numbers, right? A row count, a column count. And then updating the cells here for each cell for each row combination of row and columns. And you'll notice that each of these is documented as to preconditions and postconditions. So update space requires a count of steps to run um, uh, that are that are greater than or equal to zero. Here are a count of steps that that um, have been uh, run the the Buffer even uh, provides the initial state of the model here, et cetera. And the post condition and returns a pointer to the final state of the model. Uh, this is, sorry, this is, oh, oh, okay. Something's confused here because these two should be should be uh, distinct. Um, compute liveness uh, is basically saying, is current cell alive? It's one, if it is alive, zero, otherwise. It's giving the encodings and giving the post conditions which apply if the preconditions hold. We normally specify post conditions that are conditional on preconditions. If the preconditions aren't met, the post conditions don't necessarily apply. Um, so there's a problem with the update space one I noticed, but uh, the others seem to have, uh, as best I can tell right now, um, uh, these correct uh, these correct specifications. So these are what I I call specifications. Okay. They characterize what is being done here. And you notice the names are clearer than ABC. It's like row and count and array of current cells, et cetera. Um, for some reason, uh, this uh, um, this indenting is still off and so on, but um, uh, by and large, it's, it's, uh, it's much, much cleaner here. Um, there's something to parse the command line arguments and um, and something that uh, can indicate you know fail when it's failed. 
There's also uh, data structures that support this. And uh, there's some handling here um, that indicates it can't open the files, for example, for writing or for, for reading, I think is, is here as well. Um, yeah, for, for reading the state when it can't open it. Okay, so, you know, uh, when we create functions um, or create methods or create classes, we want to think about testability. So this, this code is longer. I would argue it's easier to test. Why is it easier to test? Give me a couple of reasons this is easier to test. Yes. Marmot? Yeah. Okay, I called you Marmot. So, so, give it a name. Here's that. I have you into the same bucket um, uh, of, uh, of, of the, um, of, of the uh, hash table. Sorry. Um, yes, the Marmot. Um, because we have functions, we can test each of them individually yeah. rather than with that previous one. We, we kind of really have it. That's right. So um, each function has a job, and that job is documented in the specification. Right? That, do that job is described in the preconditions and postconditions. It also has a, a name that someone attempts to revealing that reveals what it does. And that puts us in a good position to test it. So that's, that's a good reason that we can test more effectively because we have these functions carved out, but it's also because we have these specifications. And the names of the things we have for inputs to the functions are clear. And we know what to expect from the post commission, right? That that supports testability here. Um, what else does dividing it up into these functions support testability? What else could we do if we divide up into functions? Anyone? Yes, right. Do you better test by specific smaller chunks of code? It's it supports testing small chunks of code. And in fact, if you have one function that doesn't depend on any others, you can do really close unit tests. What if it does depend on others? Does having functions rule out testing each piece? Oh, sorry, what's the question? So the question is, let's suppose you have a function that doesn't call anything. That certainly, so it doesn't call anything else in your system. Maybe it calls a library function. You know, you can test that very easily by itself. If this is a function which calls other things, you could test it while it's calling those other things. But the dividing those um, other pieces up into functions themselves, does that also allow you to test it in isolation? And Marvin? Yes, because if there are other functions, you can simply put mocks. Yes, exactly. You can have mocking in place. And with a lot of modern environments, if you have these function interfaces, is where mocking can come in and can put in place mocks of these other functions that it calls off to. So, for example, if I have here update space um, or run scenario, maybe we'll take run scenario here. Its job is to iterate over time and call update space. But we could say basically mock out update space, put in a stub for it that just returns, you know, a fixed array or something like that. And then we can test this separately for that. So by dividing it up into functions, we get this ability to stub out or mock out or fake or put in place fakes for certain pieces of this code. Uh, and that allows us to test with kind of a uh, a fine resolution. Sometimes, of course, we want to test this with the real update space, and we, we can't. It's just, if we're trying to test, it's easier to debug, it's easier to find where the problem is, and to test each thing in isolation if, if you can mock things out for your true unit testing. And then you have unit integration testing where this calls off to other components. So those are those are all uh, 
helpful things for for testability here. Um, they're you know specifications, good naming, clear indenting, clear code conventions, commenting. Having things broken up into smaller functions with attempt revealing interfaces um, and this ability to, to divide in functions means that you can put in place mocking, et cetera. So that was a, a bit of um, a reminder of you know what what uh, testability um, uh, provides us. Now I want to talk a little bit more about this. Um, one thing we didn't see in this code, but which I'm asking for all of you is a third thing. Where is the really obvious place to put in place assertions, uh, G? Good. And with inputs come often what? Constraints. Yes, constraints that are stated in specifications and what clause? The preconditions. Preconditions. So assertions are like freebies for preconditions. What, where else would you see assertions other than preconditions? Yeah, yeah. Have to be calculated something. Yeah, you calculated something. As the sanity check, maybe you want to check that the value you calculated was bigger than zero, for example. Or that it was you know, you calculate two values, you want to make sure that they're different from each other. Or you want to make sure it's not already in the hash table where you're going to store it. Um, so often we're putting in place our thinking as developers in these assertions. Um, so within this code here, um, you know, you could have assertions in many places, wherever a programmer is making assumptions, you could you could put an assertion in place to as a sanity check. Is what I'm thinking about um, makes sense? I mentioned craft reports a little bit in the video that you talked about. Um, can anyone talk a little bit about the value of crash reports? Yes, Ian. So can I just ask something about assertion control? Sure. So I, I like to make like single single uh, purpose functions say for that calculation that I said. Yep. Does it make sense to have an assertion when a unit test is like the, the function takes in something, it does something, it, it puts out something like a let's say it's a pure function. Why have an assertion there at order for, instead of unit test? Um good question. Um so there's a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, and, and it's not a, a surefire thing. First of all, unit tests will generally, you will want to cover a wide variety of, of possible tests for that. Unit tests are not going to be run um, typically every time the system is run. And if, if this is code, which depends on values being passed to it, which could be outside the range of what you think about, like what you expect. You might want to have um, assertions for those preconditions that remain in the code, because it might alert you that you're being called from somewhere else with illegal value. It might not be a problem with your code that a unit test would find. It's a problem with somewhere else in the code base that's calling you in a way that violates your preconditions. That's not something that's per se, you're like, it, you're not at fault for it. Somewhere else in the code base is where the problem originates, but it's still good to know about that problem, right? And if it's purely in a unit test, you may not find that because you're you're calling this thing under very controlled condition, right? Um, if if it's simply uh, testing the preconditions uh, in the assertions, that can still be good because in practice, it is being used in a context where other things might violate those preconditions. Um, another reason is that preconditions and postconditions 
in the code, they they serve as documentation of the assumptions of the programmer. So when you have an assertion, it basically states what is that programmer thinking is the case? What's their sanity? What's their sanity check right now that they're imposing? What are they assuming is the case? Um, that's what an assertion document is, you know, uh, and in a document is their reasoning. And so it can be useful for others to read the code to see the assertions as well. Um, but there is an active question. There's a bit of a debate in quarters of the, uh, the community. Do you leave assertions in shipping code? Like if you ship code to customers, should the assertions be there? Can anyone give me a reason? What's the reason you might not want assertions in shipping code? Pete? I'm not sure if the assertion like break the rules. So an assertion will be checking, is this assumption true? And if it's not true, it will generally bomb out of there. And it will terminate the program. Could that be bad? Not always. Not always. Could it could it be bad? Yes. Yeah. Okay. When could it be really bad, Riley? It can be a really bad situation where it's a bit of code that doesn't matter so much, and that's a much more integral part. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah, and and particularly if it causes what sort of thing to happen, like corruption of data or loss of of data or what have you, you're bombing out and you're losing a whole document because of it or something. Right, um, that could be very undesirable, right? Um, and this is one of the reasons why some languages, for example, Java, you enable or disable assertions on a module by module basis. You actually use the minus EA flag when you're compiling it in, and it will either leave the assertions in or remove them. What's the reason you might want to keep it in, in uh, at least for some modules in shipping code? Yeah. Uh, if you're logging the errors, you can see what's going on in there. Uh, yeah, so um, that's, that is true. If there's a way that you could check the assertion and, and correctly log it in a crash report, for example, that could be very helpful to know something is broken in this program, right? Because an assertion failure indicates there's some violation of the programmer's thinking that's going on. Some some violation of their reason is, is going on. The world is not staying, you know, right now. There, there's something happening that shouldn't be happening. And tracking out where that came from is really valuable. Gee. It is because, like, sometimes there are so many functions that are, like, a function becomes right okay so what if, if what i heard correctly there is you're flipping the situation around perfectly correctly that assertions can sometimes stop data collect the corruption and it can stop the, the program from just going on its merry way, taking this value, which is not sensical, integrating it with the results, sticking into the database or updating the value of the file and basically corrupt, you know, giving bad results, right? You wanna stop bad results as soon as possible so they don't, they don't get improperly inserted in lots of places, right? And, you know, it, it doesn't end up Incorporating them in its in its files or its database or whatever. So, so there's um, some reasons either way uh, for for capturing a search. But I did ask about crash crash reports. What's the issue with crash reports? Can anyone tell me? Yes. Too much information. Um, uh, I mean, if you it can be. It depends who they go to. If they go back to the mother step, so to speak, they go back to the developers. Sometimes the developers are set to use it effectively with crash, crash reporting 
systems that basically reason about where this occurred and allow you to quickly get to the to the cause of the error. For the end user itself, they're not not helpful at all, right? And one of the recommendations is if you're building a system on smartphones, for example, um, you can have crash reporting occur when it crashes, then it's sent back and posted via HTTPS back to the developer, for example, that said, you know, what was the OS? What was the version of the software? What were what other apps were running at the time or whatever? So that you could figure out, you know, what might have caused this, right? What's the what's the library, what, what's the version of the encryption library that's being used, et cetera. And that can sometimes find find problems. Um, this this group, um, this class had expressed some questions about logging. I mean, the idea of multi-level logging, this is really old stuff uh, that I've got here, but the idea is very simple. You know, we have logging that can occur at different levels. Um, and, you know, sometimes it occurs at a error level, sometimes it occurs at a debug level, a sort of trace level, and you have escalating levels of logging that can go on. So when you open a file and close a file, you routinely log something just to mark where you are in the progress of the program. Why is that useful to have a trace of like where the program got to? Anyone? Why is that? Where does that really help? If you have if you have logging in place, well, how? To be bugged, right? You want to find out hugely what part of code is broken. If you're not looking somewhere. Yeah, if you're debugging, including if you see failed system tests for your system, for example, or failed UI tests, you want to know like where did it get to? Where in this hairball was it? Did it reach? What steps did it go through, right? Before it crashed. And so having debugging level logging or info level logging is very valuable. Um, error level logging is also a huge value in saying something is wrong, right? Um, there's an error. I failed to connect to the database. Um, and uh, that also provides, you know, essential information. The idea here is that the testers and the developers should be able to turn logging up or turn it, turn it down. What do I mean by that? What do we mean by turn it up? Sort of crank it up. Yes, again. So you could go down levels and it tests more or it logs more. Yeah, exactly. You 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 basically have more information given to you about what's going on, more detailed information. Right? Or you dial it back and you have only very high level information. And when you're debugging, often you want more detail, but maybe not always. And this is why you make it a dynamic quantity. What do I mean by I'm making a dynamic quantity? What do I mean by that? The logic one. I mean, I can change it while the program is running. Why is that important? Be able to dial it out or dial it down while the program is running. I think we've under buttons. Yeah, yeah. So there would be a whole bunch of noise before the thing that you want. Yeah. So you know the problem doesn't occur until the you know five minutes in after we got through this step. You turn debugging the, the logging level very low until you get near that step, and then you turn it really far up. And then you log like that, and, and, and hopefully you spot something going wrong. Now, the strategy doesn't always work. Why is that, for example? Why might that not work? Well, you don't really know how far back the fault lay, right? You know when the failure's occurring, but you don't always know where it came from. So sometimes you turn it on too late, and you find, wait a minute, it must have originated before this. It read that file from the database. That value was put in the database much earlier. So now I've got to go figure out what put in the database. Does that make sense? Okay. So being able to, to turn logging levels on higher. So in other words, um, I, I uh, 
see more logging or I see less logging. And to change that dynamically is really important. Um, I mentioned uh, automated crash reports, getting them sent back um, to the developers. Um, right. Um, okay. Uh, we've covered most things there. Um, I do want to just say something about this idea of a, of a test hook. Um, so, can anyone give me an example of a test hook? Give me, give me a sense of what, what, what might be a test hook. Let's suppose that you were working on a system that um, you used to make airline you know, airline trip reservation. So I, I go, when I was young, I was asked if I wanted to be one of the couple founders, founding developers of Orbitz.com. I don't know if you know Orbitz, but it's a, it's a, one of the major travel sites here. And I said, uh, now nah, I'm too busy with my graduate work. I entered it down. I think, I think my, the folks who went and did it are, there are at least uh, multi hundred millionaires um, uh, who went out to do that, but um, uh, I, I, I chose not to. But they built a system that would was very flexible for doing flight reservations, right? So you can go and book tickets on. So suppose you were doing that. What sort of test books might you have in there that would be uh, helpful? So yes, Marlon. Uh, I think it's actually between um, the systems that have those bookings and the like. Uh, I guess who you're interested in. Yeah, so so look, when you're, so that's good. Um, the idea is to give you information about what's going on along the way to get an answer back. And, and G, yeah? Can you just show the call so that we know like, how something going there? Yeah, so the idea is, look, there's this incredibly involved process in, involving connecting to external systems, you know, United flight reservation system deltas or whatever, you, you probably got to be interfacing with various external systems. You also are going to be um, uh, you know, making various system calls, et cetera. And all of these um, occur in the context of some very complicated routing. You know, you're, you're examining different routes from Boston to Saskatoon or wherever you want to go. You're, you're examining many different combinations. You only come back maybe with just a few to list for the user, but you're considering many more. And the problem is um, you often want to know what happened along the way. You know, like, like logging messages are helpful, but often you want to know internal information about like how many routes were examined or what were, what were um, all the intermediary cities that were considered to go from the, the start to the destination. Or maybe you want to know, you know, how much, how many different independent routes did it consider as in total? How many did it find legitimate? And how many did it show in the end? This is all internal information that it calculated along the way. A test hook would provide you that information about what was going on internally. A test book gives you extra information about what's going on. So if you have a class or you have a function that's doing some, some large amount of work, a test book will give you a peek at what's, what's happening internally. Um, and that's often very, very useful. Uh, it's very handy to be able to understand what's going on along the way. Um, so, you know, browsing of internal data structures, um, uh, you know, logging is, is part of this, but maybe uh, check that a database that's being used uh, by this section of code or uh, data structures are, are, you know, have proper, and I say integrity, what do I mean by integrity? What do I mean if, if Let's say a uh, hash table has integrity. What what might that mean? What might I look for? Um, so suppose this is a hash table, if you, if you just a moment, Norman, which has you know keys, um, the student ID number, and the values that has uh, 
you know, a reference to uh, the the year of that student, something like that. What what might I look for, like in half table integrity? So, Mara, yes. I was going to say consistency. Okay. Good. Um, yeah. So you want to make sure that all the student IDs are appropriate, right? Um, what else might you look besides them being of the same form? Yes, yeah. Ian. Okay, so so yeah, you want to make sure that that that's functioning correctly. But if we think about integrity of this data structure, what might what might be a flag that something is terribly wrong? Jeez. If it's Jane Oscar doing something, it should be the same way as it was before. That is something new. Uh, okay. Uh, not not quite getting what you're meaning there, but. Like for example, if there was an hash with a new condition, yeah. Then the new condition is what's going to be the same, but it's not the same. Okay, so there might be certain invariants that are are kept um kept there before the update and after the update to guarantee these things are correct. Okay, what might you when I say though that it that it has proper integrity, that it's correct, that it's in a good state. What are some flags that will be in a bad state, Riley? Okay, yeah. So what might flag it be incorrect? Give me an example. And like a hash table entries. If they even said it before, like if one, instead of being a student number, it had a person's name, that would be a problem, right? But something else that you might look for is what? Duplicate entries, right? Good, yeah, or no. Null entries, right? And maybe maybe you have entries for the keys that are all correct, but the values, some of them are null, which doesn't make sense. Do you, you have any access on the data structure? The what's not publicly access? Uh okay, yeah. So th there are issues of of what can access it, that is true. But when I talk about the integrity, what I mean is that generally data structures have certain invariants associated with them. I mean, this was referred to earlier, I think, with G, you know, like maybe this is an array and you know it has to always be a sorted array, right? Anyone? Yeah, in your textbook, is it sorted? Huh. That'd be something you might write a little function for that you use in an assertion, right? Is this sorted? So in class, uh, yes, Manat, yes. Oh, quick question. Um, is there a connection between the integrity of the data and the security of the data? Like if I told yeah. that yes. if it's easy yes. for uh, like not admin to access this data, does that also tell you that this data structure is like low in terms of integrity of it? Or yeah, I mean, it's a different concept. Yeah, this is a good question. I was thinking it goes either way because like if this could be maybe this is what Pete was after before. Like if this is a data structure which could be reached by someone without the requisite authority, requisite permission, then maybe it could be corrupted by someone, you know, um, and who who has no business being in there. And maybe you know they're trying to do something malicious, right? They're trying to cause an error condition. Which will get it to dump data, which they can then harvest, you know, credit card numbers or something like that. And so they deliberately try to mess up the data structure so that the program will be unstable so they can get can exploit it, right? And conversely, if it's if it shows signs of tampering, that's that's a sign that there might be something amiss with security. Like it, it could lead to security problems because it could put the program in a weird state, some screwed up state where people can, can break into it more easily. So in general, data structures have certain rules that they do it. No, no, none, you know, no, none of the keys should be null, none of the values should be null, or there shouldn't be any duplicates, or again, the items should be in sorted order. Or, you know, there's only one example of each value in the table or whatever. There's certain rules for that. And a test hook could look to make sure that those rules are maintained, 
right? When, whenever the, the system is run. Um, so the idea here is that, look, you're, it's sometimes called offensive program, not because it's obnoxious. It's not offensive in the sense that it's obnoxious. It's offensive in the sense of you go on offense, right? You go and you actively test, like, is this vain? And you, you know, check uh, the integrity of, of the data structures. You're performing assertions. You're checking invariance that certain things are guaranteed to be true and, and stay true. You're checking uh, checking that the things at certain points of uh, fields of a uh, class are correct. You may even examine the state of the cache for performance issues just to to get an understanding about why their performance is bad. You peek at the uh, at at what's in the cache. So what I want to point out to you here, you folks have taken three seven, and you're very used to thinking about classes as exposing functionality for other classes to service mine. And that's good. But what I'm telling you is, for the sake of debugging and the sake of performance, performance uh, evaluation and, and enhancement, Sometimes you want extra bits of information from your class for internal use. And test hooks are described this whole class of, of um, added sort of mechanisms for your classes that let you peek inside what's going on so that you can uh, up your testing game, you can test more effectively, you can help debug more effectively, and you can increase performance, et cetera, because you know more what's going on inside this hairball. You know more what's going on in here, what's working, what's not. Is it, in fact, sticking to uh, the guarantees you expect to be in place? Okay, that's all we have time for today. Um, uh, I do want you to um, go through an exercise for next time. And Thursday's class, we're going to be talking some on the testing front again. Uh, we're going to talk about specifications, which I spoke about today. We saw some examples. And then we're going to be talking about test cases and, 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 use, and, and test cases that we can use to evaluate at the unit test level and give some reference to higher levels of testing too. Okay, thank you everyone and good luck with your interviews if if you're uh, if you're working with the interviews with the internship program.